All right. Well, here we are. I'm not sure what God wants to do today. Is that scary? I don't really believe in church leaders. I just believe in church facilitators. Our job is to facilitate what the Holy Spirit is doing, not to lead the Holy Spirit. All right, just throwing that out there. Well, we're pregnant with our fourth child. It's a bit of an awkward transition there. <laughs> some of you know, some of you don't, so I just believe part of the Father is destined to be a baby factory. The Bible says be fruitful and multiply, so you don't need to pray about when you're supposed to have kids. You just have them. The Word of God commands it, so just come on with us. I've never felt ready to have a child. I don't really get that, but whatever people want to do, but they're a blessing, and God gives grace uh, for everyone that He sends, and um, I do kind of want a boy, so we can do two and two, but I have a soft spot for girls, too. And uh, no, we don't have a name. I don't know. We just found out. But we'll keep you updated. But we've got a baby boom going on. And I think last time, I tried to learn the lesson, because last time, a couple of years ago, I prophesied that a baby boom was coming, thinking what well, it was for everybody else, and then it was for us. So I stopped prophesying, and we're still having kids. So darned if I do, darned if I don't. All right, I'm going to share a message this morning called Breakthrough Faith. Many of you know that uh, I'm planted here in Lakeland. I want to continue to assure everyone that I'm not going anywhere. Um, people ask me all the time, are you leaving? No. I get offered churches all the time as I travel. I've been offered double the money, quadruple the people. Still said no, will always say no. Um, I feel planted here in Lakeland. And as uh, I continue to travel, I was in North Carolina last weekend. I preached um, eight times in three days. Um, we're blessed here just to have one service on Sunday. Um, when I travel, I usually preach about five times on Sunday. So you can imagine, I can just go, go, go. So you should feel blessed. I'm just kidding. But I was in North Carolina last weekend. Uh, just have made great friends up there watching God move in a powerful way. The church up there is about 1,500 people. Um, and even watching God rock um, that whole community that's larger. You know, a lot of people don't believe the Holy Spirit can move if you have lots of people. Um, I kind of believe the more people you have, the more the Holy Spirit should be able to move. And it's fun to jump down in those environments and, you know, multiple services, uh, you know, a day and, you know, Obviously, I honor the leaders there, so if they tell me to be done at whatever, 11.35, you know, I do that. But every time I go to these places, the Holy Spirit just starts pouring himself out. People are slaying his spirit all over the altars, and the guy always grabs the mic and says, Well, fine, we don't care about the parking lot issue and this and that. Just go. Just let God move. And uh, I believe that that's going to come uh, more and more and more, or maybe there'll be parking lot jams in large churches because people can't get off the carpet and uh, maybe more pot roast will burn and people will cancel their lunch plans and will actually allow God to captivate us with his love. I just, I really believe that time constraints could be the number one enemy of the move of God in America. I just think people are more bound to what time it is than what God is doing. And, um, you know, maybe God can do more if we showed up on time to church. Okay. I'm going to be nice today. We went from North Carolina. Uh, I preached in Tennessee all last week. Um, God moved in, in just, just powerful ways. Um, I said that all to say, you know, it's important to know what gear to be in. There were seven different churches in the book of Revelation, seven different letters. And so it's real important for me, you know, just because I'm preaching 
something on, a, on the road and the Lord gives me revelation in the different regions of the United States, that doesn't mean he's saying the same thing here in Lakeland. And uh, I believe that we are at a specific season as a body. And so I don't like to regurgitate things by any means. I'm not the kind of guy that just, well, I've got five sermons and that's where we're going to preach everywhere that I go. I want to stay fresh with the Lord. So I've shifted gears out of traveling and being under a certain type of anointing. And then I'm going to shift into what I believe that we need here at, at this body. I pray that this is a right now word. Uh, right now, where no one here is by mistake, whether you drove uh, from a long distance or you're just a member here, I want to encourage you um, to open up your heart, open up your ears to what the Spirit of God might be saying to us. Is that good? Yes. All right. Grab the person's hand next to you. I really believe that we need to create an atmosphere of faith in this room. We need to create an atmosphere of faith in this room. Does anyone have any good ideas? I'm just kidding. We put our faith in God. So as we pray, we're just going to lift up the name of Jesus. I don't know how else to do it. Faith comes by hearing. When we hear who Jesus is, we can put our faith in Him. So we're just going to pray. I'm going to ask God to increase our faith. I want to encourage you if you're struggling with discouragement, depression, anxiety, fear, those different things, God purposely brought you here today. And we're going to make an exchange. So let's pray. Lord 
but your word says that without faith, it's impossible to please you. If the goal is to be father pleasers, we must have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must come to God believing that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God, we thank you that you are a rewarder. That we must expect, as we wholeheartedly pursue you, we must expect the impossible. Lord, we declare that it's abnormal for a Christian to not to have an appetite for the impossible. We declare in this room that it's abnormal, it's strange, it's bizarre for a Christian to not have an appetite for the impossible. been written into your spiritual DNA to hunger for the impossible. It's been woven in to the divine nature that we've been given to hunger for the miraculous. God, we set aside carnal thinking. A mind that's simply set on what we can see. We pray for eternal thoughts to grip us this morning. Let something shift and change inside of us. Let no one leave here the same. Lord, I thank you that you're reawakening dreams that disappointment killed. Those that have gone numb and lost feeling because it hurts to feel. We thank you that there's emotional healing. Lord, we thank you that the cry to revival hurts. That there's an ache, there's a longing. that we cannot shut down. We must embrace it. God, in a world filled with fear and worry and anxiety, let your body arise in this hour. God, shine your light upon the saints at heart of the Father, in Lakeland, in our state, in this nation, let there be something different about us. I've written here in my notes that when we continually fill our minds with a record of what God hasn't done or what He isn't doing. We justify our own unbelief and position ourselves to be offended over the next unanswered prayer. When we continually fill our minds with a record of what God hasn't done or isn't doing, we justify our own unbelief and position ourselves to be offended over the next unanswered prayer. That's what happens when you continually fill your mind with what he hasn't done or what he isn't doing. But guess what happens when you fill your mind with what he has done and what he's about to do? Rather than being filled with unbelief and positioned 
for more disappointment when we continually fill our minds with what he's done and with what he's about to do. We fill and flood our lives with hope and joy and peace and expectation and desire that God is about to break in and answer our prayers. I want to ask you this morning, what are you filling your mind with? In fact, let's just take about 30 seconds and close our eyes again. Not in a hurry this morning. For the next 30 seconds, I would like you to recall, with the Holy Spirit's help, some of the things that God has done for you in the past. Call to memory times in your life when God's healed, when He's delivered, when he's answered. God, we say that you're good. You don't have to say it for me. Say it for you. It says he's showing you these things. Just enter into a time of thanksgiving and praise. I promise the heaviness and discouragement will go. is some of us, the older we are, the more we have to be thankful for. Maybe the older we are, the more extravagant our worship should be rather than letting the young people do it who have a very small testimony. All right, just another 30 seconds. I mean, for all that matters to me, we can do this the next hour. Lord, we thank you. We bind up all ungratefulness. Lord, we kick out all bad attitudes. No more grumbling. No more complaining. No more murmuring. No more gossiping. No more jealousy. No more bitterness. No more unforgiveness. No more of anything that grieves your Holy Spirit. Father, teach us how to rejoice when you bless people with the very thing that we want. Father, teach us how to rejoice when you open up doors for other people that you're just not seeming to open up for us. Maybe you won't open up those doors for us until we learn how to rejoice for them. Maybe it's a heart issue. Lord, we release pessimism to you. Lord, we cancel fatalistic thinking, believing the worst in every situation. Lord, for those that are simply waiting for a bad phone call, we ask that you would release healing and that you would renew their mind. I just can't overemphasize this morning how important it is to think rightly about God. And this is something that we can do every day that we wake up. I have little cards in my wallet this big that just simply list who God is. And I just read them every day and fill myself up with the knowledge of God 
knowing that I'm living in a world full of doubt, fear, anxiety, worry, depression, discouragement. The crazy thing is, is it's much in the church as it is in the world. I mean, we're, we're, we're just by living in the 21st century, we're set for a head-on collision if we know that the truth will set us free. We have opportunity, being a family of believers, to remember, to remind one another of what God has done and what He's about to do. I want to encourage you, don't, don't look at someone discouraged in church and not try to encourage them. Don't walk by depressed and anxious and worried filled worry filled people and not offer a prayer. David said in Psalm 92 2, I want to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Trying to make that my heart's desire to proclaim, to wake up and proclaim the love of God in the morning. And to declare the faithfulness of God. I don't know. I, I'm just I'm speaking out of my own. But I've been getting the fear of the Lord recently. About taking for granted what I have. And who God has been for me. I don't know if you've ever come to that startling, startling conclusion. Let's say as a business owner. That if God took his hand off your company. You'd go bankrupt tomorrow. Or are we so prideful to believe we're successful because of what we've done? I don't know if you've ever had the fear of the Lord that your children are healthy because of the hand of the Lord. I don't know what you have, what you own. But I've been getting ripped lately with my inadequacy outside of the Lord. And it puts fear and trembling in a good way inside of me. The Bible says to rejoice with trembling. To rejoice with trembling over all that God has done. People have asked me at times, do you want to be a millionaire? And I said, absolutely not. I said, why would I want more money? If I have more money, I have to not only be more accountable to the Lord for that money, but I also have way more to rejoice with trembling over. <laughs> no, can I encourage you to be grateful for what you have? Because we're all going to have to answer for that. That puts the fear of God in me. The more He gives me, the more I have to answer for and the more I have to rejoice with trembling. This effect causes me to be generous and give my stuff away rather than hoard it. I don't know who that was for. I bless you with that. I was reading in the book of Judges earlier about what happened after Joshua had died. And it says that in Judges 2, 10 through 11, and all that generation was gathered to their fathers. And the generation that came after them did not know the Lord, nor yet what he had done for Israel. Then, can you say then? Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. I want you to hear this. And all that generation was gathered to their fathers. And the generation that came after them did not know the Lord. And they did not know what he had done. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. There is a direct connection from failing to remember all that God has done to straying away from the Lord. Every time in the Old Testament that the people of Israel lost sight of what God had done, it was the open door to idol worship. Every time you and I in our lives lose sight of all that God has done, we will give birth to an Ishmael and not an Isaac.
Oh, brother, could you put it more plainly? Nope. <laughs> I've never met someone that is straying or running from the Lord that could adequately testify of all that God has done for them. Every time I've ever met a person running from the Lord, they were filled with what God hasn't done for them. Is that true? I've never met a person running away from the Lord, worshiping idols, that could readily testify of all that God has done for them. But I've met many people, perhaps all people, that are straying away from the Lord, and the core issue of their heart is, I'm mad at God for not doing X, Y, and Z. Now I want to encourage you as a Christ follower, someone that's growing in our knowledge and understanding of who God is, again, is to put our faith in God, period, and not in what we think He should do. When you start putting faith in what you think He should do, you will live a life of bitterness, disappointment, and a lot of times anger. I'm sorry I'm on the same struggle as you where I thought God said something, I pursued it, and then it didn't happen. Can anyone relate? Yeah. I don't know why we all 100% of the time do not walk in the will of God. I, I believe God is Father. He, maybe He hasn't necessarily set it up that way. That's the goal, certainly. But we learn from our mistakes and we learn from our failures. But it's like it's this song in this generation. We sing it here at the church. They sing it everywhere that I travel. There's a song that, that talks about God being a good father and how he's never going to let us down. Do you know the song? And honestly, sometimes I cringe when we sing that here. I cringe when I hear that traveling because I'm curious about people's theology. What does that mean that God is never going to let me down? Because I've been let down plenty of times. Can I just be honest? I mean, He's never going to let me down in terms of if my will is His will. Hello. But I mean, we just get excited. He's never going to let me down. And I'm just thinking, boy, are we setting ourselves up for failure if our theology is not correct? Yeah. See, being a son or a daughter of God is knowing that He knows best regardless of what I think should have happened in my life. We're not defined by what happens in life. We're defined by how we respond. That's where true Christ-likeness comes in. How will I respond when I don't get my own way? So again, I'm just here to declare to you that God's good. Whether your life works out for you the way that you thought it would or not, honestly, I don't know anybody whose life worked out the way that they thought it would. But my faith is not in circumstances. I remember ministering to a man that was in a wheelchair. Believing by faith that God would heal him. And it was like the more that we prayed, the more enraged he got over the months and over the years. And one day when I prayed for him for the a thousands, I wouldn't even say that a couple hundred times, the Lord spoke this word to me that absolutely stunned me. The Lord said his healing has become an idol in his life. His belief in me is solely tied to whether I heal him or not. And I just wonder if our faith might be tied to whether God does this or that or not.
How are we doing? You're awake, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Can our faith be unwavering in God and God alone? That nothing can change the fact that God's good. I know this is hard. But it all starts right here. Thinking rightly about God. A.W. Tozer says it's the most important thing about a Christian. What they think about God. It affects everything, every choice, every season, whether you're moving away from God or you're running to Him. It's going to all go back to that question, do you believe God's good? Do you believe He's a good Father? Regardless of how our life turns out. I believe in operating in faith. I believe in moving from the miraculous, but I can honestly tell you, I have prayed for hundreds of people. I've seen some healed and some not. And the fact that some have not got healed has never deterred my faith. Because my faith wasn't in healing. My faith was in God. I hope that's liberating. I hope that's freeing. I hope that that takes the burden off of you and just places it on our good Father. But all throughout the Old Testament, any time they lost sight of who God was, what He'd done, and what He was about to do, they just said, see ya. Something that we can learn from. Turn to Psalm 78. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to work on our hearts to uproot thought processes in our minds that can't be found in your word. Fill us with faith and hope and love. The greatest of these is love. Psalm 78, 5, talking about the Lord. This is a long chapter. We're just going to read six verses. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even to children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows, yet they turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. And they forgot his deeds and his miracles that he had shown them. I believe a lot of us are equipped for the impossible. The Lord places us in situations and circumstances. We're literally ready, but we're not ready because we've forgotten what he's done. Literally every breakthrough, every miracle, every intervention, every holy interruption, every time you could just say, thank you, Lord. And I just encourage people, if you forget, thank Jesus for the cross. Thank him for deliverance from hell. I mean, that's something just to worship. And I always tell people that's the only thing we could actually ever offer people was the gospel. By the way, that is the gospel. Jesus. Not Jesus and our prosperity. Just Jesus. If we could only offer Jesus to people. Period. Let that be enough to go into a state of rejoicing and thanksgiving. It's like one guy told me arrogantly, I think God got something good when I got saved. <laughs> But I wonder how many of us, we show up to church thinking God owes us something. 
We've done him a favor by waking up early and coming into his house. Uh, God doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need anything. We, we've almost, I don't even know why I'm talking about this. It's almost like the gospel has become about this needy God who needs more followers. No, he's holy. He's righteous. He's true. He loves us. See how much our culture is fighting the gospel and right thinking about God. Yet I'm telling you in our seasons of deep, deepest disappointment and discouragement, all of what we're talking about this morning becomes fundamental issues. So God established a testimony in Jacob. It says that he broke in, he showed himself true, so that with the express purpose that the testimony of God could be passed down to our children. It begs the question for us as parents, are we regularly sharing with our kids what God has done for us? It seems to be such a tragedy when I talk to most children, they don't even have a clue about what their parents' real testimony is. Remember the book of Judges. Think about this. He freed them out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He brought plagues. I mean, and after Joshua, a generation arose. I mean, guys, Jericho, like a city fell down because people shouted and worshipped. Like, that's weird. A generation grew up not knowing the Lord not knowing what he's done so they worship the Baals. Again, fear of the Lord for me. I'm setting my children up for idol worship by not sharing what God has done for me. I feel the anointing all over me. Now I'm talking like inner conversation. I'm talking about you're on your recliner and you shut off the TV and your boy or your girl, if they're young enough, just crawls up into your lap and you say, hey, let, let me tell you what God did when dad was 17. And you begin to fill the next generation with hope and wonder and expectancy. It is abnormal. It's not normal for a Christian to not have an appetite for the impossible. We have settled for far too long in the church for cultures where we just expect a bad report. And I am believing with all that I have within me but not just me or a few people, but that we would literally, by the grace of God and the help of the Holy Ghost, create an atmosphere in Lakeland of expectancy and hope and belief in the impossible. That we would declare this a cancer-free zone. Yes, we believe for God to heal David Vespa. No, he was not healed. Did that detract my faith in God at all? Absolutely not. We prayed for God to heal my son's heart. I prayed over him every night, 58 times. Did God heal him? No. Is my faith in God any less? Absolutely not. God is good. But frankly, I don't, it, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not going to stop pursuing God because I'm following God. Not how much money is in my bank account. Not whether my marriage is struggling or not. I, I don't give my, I don't sow in. I don't put 
my hope and my trust and my satisfaction in anything else but Him. We, we can't live any other way or we will be unstable and I just will be roller coaster Christian Christians. Like praise God when my life is great and you know forget God when my life is going bad. To me that sounds like a fan of Jesus, not a follower. I mean, has anyone else ever had to battle disappointment? Like, huh? But I just, I've had the Lord say to me so many times, why is an invalid question that turns you into an invalid? I don't know. I, we're, we're, some things happen in life. We're never going to know why. But I'm not going to ask why for so long that I turn my life into being a victim and not a victor. We are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be defined by you. You name it. My, your father was an abuser. Listen, I, 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 I can assure you that the heart of God, the Father, wept and cried when you cried. I can't even put into words the compassion and mercy of God toward you for whatever that you experience. But sooner or later, we have to ask ourselves, do I really want to be healed? So I used to throw around my issues like bait for people to feel sorry for me. And I realized once I let God heal me, oh Jesus, once I let God heal me, I didn't have anything to talk to the people about. <laughs> Yeah, there you go, the Eeyore syndrome. I mean, what if, what if you really got free, though? What if you really got healed? What if he, he really delivered you from your past and the only reason why you needed to tell your testimony or spill your guts is if there was an opportunity to bring the kingdom of God here on earth? So our capacity to remember what God has said and done in our lives is one of the primary things that determines our success or failure in sustaining a life of breakthrough and miracles. Let's look at two passages and we'll close but quickly. Turn to Mark chapter 6. Let's just look at the man Jesus, the God man, and his life and what he was desiring to teach the disciples and then to pray. Mark chapter 6. Just give me about 15 minutes and we'll close. Mark chapter 6. Going to begin reading in verse 33. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're mad at me, say amen. Amen. <laughs> I'll give you Barry's email after this. <laughs> Mark 6, 30, Mark 6, we're going to begin reading in 33. 5,000 are fed. And the people saw them going, and many recognized them, and they ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great multitude and felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it was already quite late, his disciples came up to him and began saying, The place is desolate and it is already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Does that sound like a pretty logical? Okay, there's 5,000 people that are hungry. The disciples are thinking rationally here, okay, we don't really have food, send them away. 
What's Jesus say? 37. But he answered them and said, You. Can you say you? You. You give them something to eat. It's kind of like asking God to come and break in. And he's like, that's why you're there. God, come and free me from my job because there's all these worldly people. The Lord's kind of like, well, how are they going to get delivered of their worldliness unless they encounter godliness? And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. When they found out, they said five and two fish. He commanded them all to recline by groups on the green grass, and they reclined in companies of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves, the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed the food, broke the loaves, and kept giving them the disciples to set before him. He divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate loaves. I love that there's extra. I love that there's extra. I love that we serve a God who just doesn't want to meet your need. He wants to do immeasurably more. But again, are we asking... Where's, where's our faith in this God that not just wants to meet the big things? See, I was always a believer in God meeting the big needs. I just didn't think he cared about the details. There's more than enough. Verse 45. This is one of the funniest stories in the Bible. And immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he himself was sending the multitude away. After bidding them farewell, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when it was evening, the boat was in the midst of the sea and he was alone on the land. And seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and he attended to pass them by. How funny is that? <laughs> These guys are out on the boat, straining, fear, anxious, worrying. He's just going to pass them on by. <laughs> what was he thinking? <clears throat> 49, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out. <laughs> For they all saw him and were frightened. But he immediately spoke with them and said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were greatly astonished. Underline verse 52. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. See, I, I've heard people preach the Jesus feeds the 5,000 like many, many times. But I've never heard anybody preach the whole story. Because he just didn't feed them. He didn't feed 5,000 people just because he could. He just doesn't come and break into our lives. He doesn't come to deliver and save and, and just for nothing. And so we can, every time God breaks in, every time He demonstrates His power is so that you can take that miracle testimony into the storm that's about to be ahead. See, because again, I wish I could tell you, come to Jesus and everything will be all right. You might hear that on TV, but you won't hear that here. I'm sorry, Jesus promised. I mean, I know I've had those days where I want to turn him into a highlighter God. Just highlight the things you like and ignore the things you don't. 
Jesus said, you will have trouble in this life. Darn it. You know the next part? What is it? Why? Good. Good. Through many trials and tribulations. I mean, the Bible, I don't know where these people get their theology, but it's in there. But we all go through different seasons. Again, part of being a family, a community of believers here at the church is people are in so many different seasons. People are in the mountaintop. Somebody's in the valley. Somebody's getting married. Somebody died. Somebody, I mean, somebody's going through the worst season of their life and somebody's getting so much favor you just want to slap them when you see them. <laughs> Not really. But we've got to believe, we've got to stretch our faith that as the Lord is working in every season, there's always insight. There's always a lesson. There's always a revelation. There's, so, there's always something that he's after teaching us again, not so that we can just hold it in, but that we can share it with others. I don't know that the body of Christ has yet stepped into this dimension of family that when we get together again, the topic or what dominates the conversation is all the time God has broke in and been good. So that when people walk away, their faith in God is accelerated. I mean, you know how awesome it is to hear a testimony from a couple that went through hell and still believes God's good? I mean, you might be sitting there thinking, man, that was a horrible season. Can I tell you somebody else is going to have a horrible season? I literally believe whatever we hide, Satan gets credit for. But whatever we expose, God gets the glory for there is nothing that has ever happened in your life, no matter how terrible, that God cannot use for His glory. What you've been through, we were at a wedding last night in St. Pete. I don't know if you all know Shiloh, the young lady up here. She got married last night, and we're, we're sitting there, and what do they call them? Like caterers, like this caterer lady came by, and I just started just flowing in the Holy Ghost, just dropping bombs on her. I mean, I just probably said 15 words of knowledge, and she just kind of looked at me, got choked up, started crying, and walked off. And it was like it happened in an instant. I saw her, and boom, it just came out. Then I didn't see her for a while. She later told me she had to take a 10-minute break. She broke down in the bathroom. I went up and said, ma'am, I'm, I'm so sorry if that offended you. She said, no, you have no idea. My husband committed suicide. Blew his head off. She said, you have no idea the, the, the regret and the pain and the rejection and the family blamed me. I mean, I, I was literally just tearing up with this poor lady working at a waiting catering event. And I'm literally there telling her, all of this did not happen for nothing. She was into the new age, the occult. She connected with the whatever. And I'm just telling her straight up, Jesus is the only way. He, he, he has purpose. He has destiny. You cannot believe that you were sexually molested, that you were whatever the depths of the pain of humanity. What did that just, well, I'll just live the rest of my life in pain. No, God wants to use that for your deliverance and His glory. He wants to use your testimony to set someone else free. I just wonder how many prisons and how much is locked up in the body of Christ because we're not yet comfortable declaring all of who God is. Can I just encourage you? That's the type of atmosphere we want to create here. Isn't it such a blessing 
Beloved, that there's so many young people. I want to see moms and dads in this room get more invested in this next generation. And to be honest, it's, it's not even what I feel like I want. It's in the Bible. In the last days, God says, He's going to turn the hearts of fathers back to sons and the hearts of mothers back to daughters. There's going to be a family dynamic that's going to be so powerful. And this is where I believe the awe and the wonder of the New Testament church comes in. I didn't need a mic to preach a sermon because I could invite a couple of people over my house and let heaven come and have no time constraints. Hallelujah. Where were we? So the 5,000, he just didn't feed them just for fun. It says their hearts were hardened. It's like Jesus said, I gave you a testimony, a demonstration of my power and you failed to carry it into the storm. I don't know if you're here this morning and you're in the midst of the storm. You're in the valley of decision. You're not really sure where to go. But I'm going to tell you what's going to get you through the midst of the storm is going to be remembering all that God has done. He is faithful. He is innocent. He's for us, not against us. Amen? And if this wasn't enough to feed 5,000, Jesus is going to do it again two chapters later. Turn to Mark 8. I mean, when I, when I think about celebrating God, something that comes to mind is I love to celebrate the patience and long-suffering of God because I know how much of a knucklehead I am. I mean, can you imagine God being a father, literally breaking in and providing like five billion zillion times? And then another trial, another storm comes and we start whining, complaining. I can imagine how that makes him feel. I mean, as a father, I want to provide for my children. I want them to feel secure. I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel taken care of. I don't like it when they get some poverty thing like, oh, I, I wonder if we're going to eat tonight. I hate that. Can any dads relate? I mean, just something I think he's put inside of us. But here God is father. I'm just, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He knows when we sit and when we rise. He knows every hair on our head. I mean, He's the God of the universe who has chosen to take up residency inside of us. And we talk about getting blown away and we just come in. Oh, God. Oh, please help me. I mean, do you, do you know we believe in the virgin birth? Let's, I was going back to you. You don't believe that God could heal that guy's broken ankle, but you believe that like the Holy Spirit impregnated a woman? What? Like you believe someone actually rose from the dead and is living on it? What? This is just stuff that I fill myself with. I fill my mind and my heart with, with biblical truths. I mean, all these different things so that when impossibilities stand before me, I just simply meditate and flow in possibilities. So if Mark 6 wasn't enough, here comes Mark 8. Thank you, Jesus. Who can thank him for his patience? Any fellow knuckleheads? Any fellow whiners and complainers? And we serve a good God, boy. I mean, has anyone ever thanked God that you're not him? Like, Lord, if I was God, I would have slapped that person down. I would have... 
All right, my flesh is coming out. I mean, he is so patient. And those people you think he's ready to strike down. I mean, and then he pours out his love and his mercy. You're like, what? Do you know that 3,500 babies are murdered in America every day? We are murdering 3,500 babies a day in America. And yet God is still blessing this nation. Hello, wake up. <coughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, that's grace. All right, Mark 8. In those days again, can you say again? We thank you that he's the God of again. When there was a great multitude and they had nothing to eat. Surprise. He called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the multitude. For they have remained with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. God, we thank you for your compassion. If I send them away hungry to their home, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a distance. His disciples answered him, where will anyone be able to find enough to satisfy this man? <laughs> where will anyone? He was asking them, how many loaves do you have? They said seven. He directed the multitude to sit on the ground. He took the seven loaves, gave thanks, broke them, started giving them out to the disciples. They also had a few small fish. After he blessed them, he ordered them to be served as well. They ate and were satisfied, and they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. And about 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Down Manutha. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. Is this crazy? He does it a second time. There's leftovers, and these knuckleheads forget to take the leftovers in the boat. Does it ever astonish anyone else how quickly you forget what God has done? This is why in the Old Testament, they literally put it on their forehead, on their arms. It, what was the Lord trying to do? On, on, the, on, the, uh, on the top of the door to create an atmosphere of expectancy. Yeah. Write the law. Wear a box. Wear the straw. I mean, whatever that we've got to do, but I get blown away. I get convicted. If another need comes up, anxiety, worry, stress, fear, and I'm just, Lord, I need to repent. Can I encourage some of us as we close that some of us need to repent? Of having such little faith in the storm that we're facing now. We could ask Father for forgiveness and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I know you're patient. I know you're long-suffering. Please give me another chance. And I can tell you, you can leave to here today knowing that He will. He will give you another opportunity. Do not lose faith in Him. No matter the circumstances, no matter what you're facing. So we'll close here. He says, verse 15, He was giving orders to them saying, Watch out. Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Jesus, aware of this, said, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? 
When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? They said to him, 12. And when I broke seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full did you pick up? He said, they said seven. And yet he was saying to them, do you not understand? When our ability to see runs out, when our ability to hear runs out, no one can take away your ability to remember. When you're in that season and you can't see, when you're in that season and you cannot find the voice of God to save your life, I want to tell you, you can always remember what God has done and draw strength and draw faith from that process. Where you bow your heads with me. Let's just take just a few minutes this morning. Again, I believe that no one here this morning was here by mistake. Father, here we are. I don't know what each one of us is facing or going through. But Father, we are asking that you would soften our hearts. Thank you. 